Our scripture passage this morning is from Luke's Gospel and chapter 11, and it's Jesus teaching on prayer. And we read from verse 1, as far as verse 13. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend. I'm glad you've got friends rather than... <laughs> And you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship... Yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is God's word. Let's just pause a moment. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. We can hardly imagine what it would be like to be a disciple of Jesus, living constantly with him, listening to his teaching, watching his compassion as he healed the sick and comforted the sorrowful. But perhaps one of the things which surprised and bewildered them was that the fact that when they woke up on most mornings, Jesus wasn't there. He got up early to be with his Heavenly Father. And frequently the Gospel writers tell us that he arose early in the morning to pray with his Father. And that close communion with his Father God was so important to the busy ministry of Jesus. And the disciples, of course, had noted this. But what is real prayer? Real prayer. Numerous books over the century have been written about it. Thousands of sermons have been preached about it. Hymn writers have tried to help us. James Montgomery wrote this. Prayer is the Christian's vital breath, the Christian's native air. His watchword at the gates of, he- of death, he enters heaven with prayer. And Luke, as he writes his gospel, reveals that our Lord's teaching on prayer grew out of a question from one of his disciples. We're not told who. 
You can imagine the discussion, because they often had discussions, the Gospels tell us this, that took behind. You ask him. No, no, I'm not. Why not you? Until eventually one of them plucks up courage and dares to pose the question which was uppermost in most of their minds. Lord, teach us to pray. And then they added, just as John taught his disciples. Well, we usually think of John the Baptist as a prophet and a martyr. And yet the disciples of Jesus remembered that he was a man of prayer. John was a miracle baby himself, filled with the Holy Spirit before he was born. And it was an amazing answer to prayer by his aged parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth. And when you look at his life and his ministry, you realise that John the Baptist had to pray. He was privileged to introduce the Messiah to Israel. And Jesus himself said that John was the greatest of all the prophets. And yet John had depended on prayer. John's disciples had to pray and Jesus' disciples wanted to learn better how they ought to pray. Note that they did not ask the master to teach them how to preach better. They didn't ask him how to do amazing signs and wonders. They asked him to teach them to pray for they could see how their master, the perfect son of God, had depended on prayer as he ministered among them. Warren Wearsby says in his commentary, effective prayer is the provision for every need and the solution for every problem. Can I say that again? Effective prayer is the provision for every need and the solution for every problem. And what our Lord does in answer to their question is to give them a pattern for prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer, not because Jesus prayed it, because he never did. He never had to ask for forgiveness. But because he taught it. There's nothing wrong with praying this prayer personally or as part of a congregation, as long as we do it from a believing heart that is sincere and submitted. And I particularly like what we did this morning. As we broke up the prayer quietly. I hate it when it's parrot form. How easy it is to recite these words, not really mean them. But that can happen even when we sing or even when we preach. The fault lies with us, not with the prayer. Lyndon Johnson's press secretary, Bill Moyers, was saying grace at a staff lunch and the president shouted... Speak up, Bill. I can't hear a thing. And Moyes quietly replied, I wasn't addressing you, Mr. <laughs> President. It's good to remind ourselves, isn't it, that when we pray, we converse directly with God. And true prayer involves responsibility, honouring God's kingdom and doing God's will. It has been said that the purpose of prayer is not to get a human's will done in heaven, but to get God's will done on earth. Prayer is asking God to use us to accomplish what he wants, so that his name is glorified and his kingdom is extended and strengthened and his will done. It's important for every believer to know the word of God. For there we discover the will of God. We must never separate prayer from the word. During my time in ministry, I've seen professed Christians disobey God and defend themselves by saying things like, well, I prayed about it and God said it was all right. Hmm. This included the girl who married an unconverted man. fellow living with a girl who was not his wife and even a preacher who started his own church because all the other churches were wrong and only he had true spiritual light and insight. Friends, once we're secure 
in our relationship with God and with his will, then we can actually bring our requests to him. He wants us to do that. We can ask him to provide for our needs for daily living, to forgive us for what we've done wrong yesterday and the day before and even this morning, to lead us into the future. All of our needs may be included in these three requests, material and physical, moral and spiritual, and divine protection and direction. And if we pray in this way, we can be sure of praying in God's will. Not as in the story which uh, J. John related, which I love and I hope you will too. A woman was at work when she received a phone call telling her that her daughter was ill. She left work and went to the pharmacist to buy some flu medicine. Unfortunately, having done so, she returned to discover that she locked her keys in the car. Wow, have you done that? She looked around for a rusty coat hanger and amazingly, she found one. (laughs) But didn't know how to use it. She bowed her head and she prayed for help. And within seconds, a scruffy man appeared. She was so desperate, she told him her plight and asked him, do you know how to break into a car with one of these? Sure, said the man, and within a minute he'd opened the car door. The woman hugged him and thanked him profusely. Thank you so much, she said. You're a very nice man. And the man replied, lady, I'm not a nice man. I just got out of prison today. I was in prison for car theft. And I've only been out one hour. And the woman shouted, Thank you, Lord, for sending me a professional. (laughs) In answer to the disciples' question, Lord, teach us to pray. The Lord Jesus gave them a wonderful illustration to focus their attention and to capture their thoughts. He said, suppose one of you has a friend. And then he said, You go to him in the middle of the night and you say, my dear friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine has come on a journey, he's just arrived at my house and I've got nothing to put before him. And he will answer from the inside, don't make life difficult for me, my man. The door is shut, my children and I are all in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Then Jesus looked around at his disciples and seeing that they were hanging on to every word that he was saying, he added... Let me tell you, even if he can't get up and give you anything just because you're his friend, because of your shameless persistence, he will get up and give you whatever you need. What an amazing illustration for the Saviour to use. I remember some years ago now when our son Jonathan backed him into a ditch on a, a lonely road and telephoned me late at night to help him get out of this embarrassing mess, especially as his first date with a young lady. (laughs) What do you do? Sorry, Jonathan. We're too comfortable at home. We aren't coming. But because he is my son, there was no question. And also because we have a good, strong relationship. You see, there are times when I wonder where fatherhood and friendship begins and this is what Jesus is hinting at here in this story friendship and fatherhood go together and they teach us something about God and prayer actually the learning can be a two way thing it's not just a matter of thinking about earthly friends and fathers and learning that God is like them There are times when a father needs to take a long, hard look at what God's fatherhood is all about and start changing his own fatherhood behaviour to be more like it. Most of our friendships, I suspect, could do with the improvement that some reflection of God as a friend might provide. It is that picture of a God as a friend in bed, asleep, with his children around him, which probably strikes us as rather unusual. We don't imagine God like that, do we? 
We're used to saying that God is our Father. Though we may not always ask what exactly that means. But to think and meditate on God as our friend is less obvious. In the sort of house Jesus had in mind when he tells this story, the family would all sleep side by side on the floor, on the upper part level of the house. So that if his father got up at midnight, the whole family would be disturbed and woken. And then he got to get through all the animals, which were on the lower f- level. But the crisis situation was still there. The friend on the outside had got a real problem. And he cannot handle it himself. So it is why he comes to his friend. And the sleeping friend inside is the only one who can actually help him. And the laws of hospitality in the ancient Middle East, and especially in the Jewish community, were strict. And if a traveller arrived needing food and shelter, a person was under an obligation to provide it. And the friend in the street knows that the friend in the bed will understand his predicament. And he will do the same if the roles were reversed. What counts, according to Jesus, is persistence. There are all sorts of ways in which God, like the sleepy friend, but Jesus is focusing on one point of comparison only. He's encouraging a kind of holy boldness. A sharp knocking on the door, an instant asking, a search that refuses to give up. And that's what prayer should be like. When have you been that desperate? When have you felt at your wit's end and you've prayed like that? You see, prayer isn't just a routine of formal praying, going through the motions or a daily or weekly task. It's not saying prayers, it's actually praying. There's a battle on. There's a fight with the powers of darkness. And those who have glimpsed the light are called to struggle in prayer for peace, for reconciliation, for wisdom, for a thousand things for the world and the church, and perhaps a hundred or two for one's own family and neighbours and friends, and perhaps a dozen or two for oneself. There are, of course, too many things to pray about. That's why it's important to be disciplined and regular. But because these things are urgent, important and complex, there has to be more to prayer than simple discipline and regularity. It needs to be effective. It needs fuel for its engine. And to be effective, prayers need energy too. In this case, the kind of dogged, an even funny determination that you would use with a sleepy friend who you hoped would help you out of a tight spot. The larger picture, though, is the more familiar one of God as Father. This isn't just an illustration drawn from family life, though, of course, that's at its heart. And Jesus' illustrations about giving a child real food rather than poisonous snakes make their point. If we're ever tempted to imagine God as a tyrant who would take delight in giving us things that weren't good for us, we should remember these pictures and think again. To call on God as Father was to invoke the God of the Exodus, the liberating God, the God whose kingdom was coming, bringing bread for the hungry, forgiveness for the sinner, and deliverance from the powers of darkness. It's comforting to know that we come to God in prayer. We're actually coming to God the Father. And because he knows and loves us, we need never be afraid of the answers that he will give. And Jesus argues from the lesser to the greater. He says, if an earthly father gives what's best to his children, surely the Father in heaven will do even more. I believe the key phrase in these verses comes towards the end. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, how much more 
Will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Jesus speaks here of the how much more of the Heavenly Father. What a beautiful phrase that is. And it's true. And I want you to take that home with you this morning. God has so much more for you to appreciate and apply in your life. In these latter verses, Jesus has been talking about fathers who for all their human frailties give good gifts and good things to their children. The household in the story is the father, but also a friend who even if a a bit reluctant will not leave his friend in need. Now God the father is not a miser, reluctant to give. On the contrary, He longs to pour out his blessing, blessing upon blessing on his children, for whom there is no greater gift than the Holy Spirit. And the whole passage could be summed up in this way. The pattern prayer that Jesus gave tells us that we should pray inclusively. The parable that Jesus said tells us that we should pray persistently. And the principle of this whole section tells us that we should pray expectantly. So go out this morning with your eyes open to the possibilities and the opportunities that the Lord wants you to grasp and take hold of from his word. Allow the Holy Spirit to fill you anew and ask him to do it. It would be a sad thing for you to go away feeling bereft and defeated. For we have the Lord Jesus saying that we can know and have the how much more blessing of the Heavenly Father with that supreme gift of the Holy Spirit to empower us for our daily living. So our prayer must be the words of our final hymn. There must be more than this, O breath of God, come breathe within there must be more than this spirit of God we wait for you fill us anew we pray fill us anew we pray consuming fire into a flame a passion for your name spirit of God fall in this place Lord have your way Lord have your way with us